But uh, today we, we are here to talk about uh, wisdom. You too can be a wise guy. And uh, I'm not talking about the wisdom of smart people or even of Yoda. <laughs> do or do not, there is no try. You know, good Yoda stuff. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. That's another Yodaism. Yoda was a great character, lots of good, deep stuff. That is true. That's good advice. But uh, deep wisdom is the wisdom that comes from God. So why are we even bothering to talk about this? Well, because everybody has the same question in their life. Uh, how can I be happier? How can I make my life or the life of other people better? It's one of the reasons that you're here today at church, to find out the answers to those kinds of questions. And without true wisdom, we will constantly struggle. And let's face it, folks, we have enough struggling in our lives as it is. So let's see if we can help you out in a little way to, to help you discover to, 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 uh, a way to make your life and the lives of the people you love a little bit better. Parents, this will make you a better mom and dad. Uh, this will make you a better friend, a better sister, a better brother, a better coworker, a better leader. This will make you a better person. I decided very, very early in my Christian walk that, uh, the, that the main thing, that the first thing that I was going to concentrate on is, is following the rules, the, the lessons that are taught by Jesus. Um, very, very wise, and so I decided I will follow that path, I will follow those rules. And uh, once I made that decision, I got up every morning and, and I, I bought myself a cross uh, like that and uh, put it on uh, in the morning when I get dressed every day. Uh, not to tell other people that, hey, look at me, I'm a Christian, but for me, to remind me every time I walk by uh, something that's a reflective service and see myself in the mirror, look down every morning to start that day, reminding me of this. And I've had a lot of these different ones. I use the same one always. I, I uh, got, you know, depending on what I'm wearing that day. <laughs> got, got to be fashionable. Got to match the outfit. But it's all for the same reason. It's there for a reason. And, uh, sometimes uh, I wear this. Now, these are three uh, bands of, of, of Bob Wire wrapped around. But uh, I wear it not to be very fashionable, although I am. Uh, <laughs> but, but that reminds me of a crown of thorns. It reminds me of Jesus when I put it on. And I, and I keep that on there. And every now and then I look down because I want to always remember what would Jesus do. Remember that? WWJD? <laughs> People had neck, uh, bracelets that said WWJD. What would Jesus do? And it became like a cliche, and people were like, oh, that's so 1990s. But pretty good advice. If you can ask yourself in every situation, what would Jesus do? And if you do that, don't just ask the question, but actually act upon it, you will live a better life. You will have a much better, much better time. It's important to, to, to turn to wisdom in the best sources and not just the stuff that we come up with in our lives that because we've lived our limited experiences that we have. Proverbs says, trust the Lord with all your heart and don't depend on your own understanding. So that's what we're going to dive in today. And uh, for today, our purposes are the, 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 the definition of the word wisdom is this. Listen, taking the lessons that God teaches you in the Bible and using them to live according to his will. That using them part is really important. You know, you're going to read the Bible all day long. If you don't apply it, then it's, it's pointless. So uh, in other words, walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk. Don't just read the read, but actually walk the walk. And you can only do that if you're familiar with the words. So there are six steps that we're going to talk about today to uh, learning good biblical wisdom. And the first one is read the Bible. Read the Bible. Proverbs uh, also says, only the Lord gives wisdom. He gives knowledge and understanding. <sighs> but it's hard to read the Bible, Rory. It's hard. And it takes time. Yes, it does. Yes, it is. You know what? It's also hard. It takes time to be good at sports or to rehearse a play or to learn to play a musical instrument or, or to dance or to fix a car, to put code into a computer. Whatever your thing is, it's hard to learn how to do that. And it takes time. But the thing is, anything that's, that's worth doing usually has a, a, a certain difficulty in learning how to do it. And it's not as hard as most people think to read the Bible. I was just talking to somebody, right? Uh, I was talking to Taz just right before the, he was saying his cousin is just getting into it. He says, I can't get into the Bible. I, tell you, I can't read it. I said, what version does he have? He says, it's a King James Version. I was like, aha. 
Now, I'm not putting down the King James Version. And it's a great version of the Bible, if, if you can read it. But there are lots of different versions of the Bible. We're going to talk about some of those. For example, here's some up here. Uh, there's the King James Version up there. You see the New Century Version. Of, you know, well, these are all different. The New International Version, New English Translation, The Message, J.B. Phillips' New Translation, the Easy to Read Version. That's, uh, that's a quite a few different versions that you have to choose from. As a matter of fact, there's even a few more uh, to choose from. You could choose from all those. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's even a few more. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, there, there, there's some more even there. So as you can see, there's quite a few different versions of this. To get. And there's some more. So is there more? Yeah. So which is the best one? People ask that all the time. In fact, people have their choice. Like, this is the Bible. I know an elder at, a, at, a, at another church, not at this church, that, that says, if you don't read from this particular Bible or this particular translation, you are not reading the Bible. This is not the Bible. Other people say, oh, no, it's got to be that translation or that translation over there. Everybody has their different thoughts. on It has to be this particular one. Well, no, I'm here to tell you that in my opinion and the opinion of some others, that is not necessarily true. What's the best version? I'll tell you what I think is the best version. The one that draws you closer to God and makes his word the clearest to you. Amen. It's more important to understand a verse than it is to know how it's worded in a certain version of the Bible. In my Bible study group, these are, by the way, whenever I write a sermon for you guys, this is, this is a nice Bible. It's about 100 years old. Isn't that a beauty? You know, uh, but... It's written in, in an archaic way that I can't read. And so when I do a sermon for you guys, I, I work off of these three regularly. Uh, New International, New, New Century Version, and The Message, which is, is a very, very modern take on the Bible. But when I am in my small group Bible study, which one do we work off of? You could have everybody on the same one, so you're all in sync with each other, but we don't do that in my Bible study. Everybody has a different version. It's just the one they liked, whatever they showed up with. That's the one I like, that's the one I like, that's the one I like. So when we go over a passage, I'll read the passage aloud, and then we'll all go, oh, yeah, yeah, read your version. Well, how does yours put it? And they read their version aloud, and then read your version. How does yours put it? And they read their version aloud, and by the fourth one, you've pretty much got the message down pretty good because they're all extremely similar. It's just a little word here, a little word there, and it makes it easier for you to read. Now, it's not just me that says this. Christianity Today, which is sort of an authority in the world of Christianity, says this. We understand the written word of God best when we read and hear it in our own language, in the vernacular of the day. The gap between reading what we read in the Bible and what we face in our culture is wide enough without confronting the reader with an unfamiliar vocabulary and archaic grammar. So I'm here to say, find a, find a version of the Bible that works for you. And... Just to give you some examples here, uh, I'm going to read uh, Genesis 1 first, you know, right off the beginning of the Bible, and uh, we'll just read it basically from New uh, King James, and it, and it goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now let's take that exact same passage from a different translation, a, different, a paraphrase, which is called the word on the street. It goes like this. First off, nothing. No light, no time, no substance, no matter. Second off, God starts it all off and then wham, stuff everywhere. The cosmos is in chaos. No form, no shape, no function, just darkness, totally. Floating above it all, God's Holy Spirit, ready to play. Day one, God's voice booms out, lights, and from nowhere, light floods the sky, and night is swept off the sea. Pretty cool. <laughs> I'd love to listen to the word on the street on the radio. There's a guy that reads it, and it's really dramatic, and it's really cool. Here's one excerpted from a, a Bible called the Black Bible Chronicles. It goes like this. One day, as folks were starting to press all around Jesus, you'll recognize this story probably from the Bible, he decided to go up on the hill for a minute, rap with the chosen brothers. He wanted them to know what was up. He, you know, there's a little something for everybody, Jesus told them. Brothers who are down in the way they feel, they ain't got nothing to worry about because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. 
Even those who feel like they've lost can be won again because there will be arms around them to make them feel better. And you know those, brother, those brothers who seem weak and on the bottom of the tadpole? The world is theirs. No kidding. And those folks who always do right, got a kind word to say, a good deed or two to do, it's coming back to them in spades. The brother shows kindness and mercy. It's coming back to him more than he can count. Some people can relate to that. Some people can relate to the New King James Version, which to me is like reading Shakespeare. One of the most interesting ones is a, is, is a Hawaiian translation. And now, I'm going to flash this up here because I'm going to read it to you, but you've got to read along to see that how it's actually written. So put that up there, and this is uh, Jesus walks on, the, on top of the water. Before dark time, go read it along. Before dark time come, Jesus went down to the lake. They go inside one bow, and they start for to go to the other side of the lake, Capernaum side. Now, now, now dark time went come already, and still, uh, yet Jesus never come by them. Then one strong wind will begin to blow, and the waves was coming more big. And Jesus, guys, went rode a boat three, four miles, and, and then they spoke Jesus walking on top of the water. He was coming near the boat, and they was real scared. But Jesus tell them, this me, no scared. Then they let him come inside the boat. <laughs> the Bible can come alive when you read it in different, different translations in different ways. It's fascinating stuff. You can read the Bible on your phone if you don't have a Bible. You can get a Bible that if you want to do what I do is just I really, really follow Jesus' teachings. You can get one that is called a red letter Bible with all of Jesus' words are in red letters. Very easy to pick them out. You can watch the, listen to the Bible on CDs. You can watch video of most of the Bible you, on, online. You go to BibleGateway.com. They have videos of, of the whole thing. So step one is read the Bible, listen to the Bible, watch the Bible, get into the Word of God. Second step to biblical wisdom is fear the Lord, or as I like to put it, respect the Lord. Because fear, yeah, that word, you know, to fear the Lord is a little spooky to somebody. How many people here like to be scared? Most people know. I mean, maybe at the movies or on a roller coaster or something where you know it's safe. But in real life, nobody likes to be scared. And there's no reason to fear. We shouldn't be doing what we're doing out of, out of fear that God will smite us or we will burn in hell or whatever it is. There's, first of all, there's no reason to fear. Because why do we fear? We fear because we might be punished by God. But... The hammer of God has already fallen. It fell on Jesus. God loves us. God is love. And 1 John 4.18 tells us there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. Besides, the term of fear of God is often misunderstood. It's, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's, people are afraid that they will get you know, struck down by God or something, but fear of God is more like uh, respect for God. It's like fear of fire. Fire is a good thing. You know, fire it keeps us warm, it cooks the food, it, 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 it gives us light at, at night. I mean, it, it was a really good thing. And in, in the ancient days, there was a guy that was in charge of keeping the fire going because they didn't know how to start fire back then. So they'd find a fire from a lightning strike or something, they'd keep it in a pot, and his job is to keep it going. We went around, there's a movie called Quest for Fire about that, if, if you, it's an old movie from the 80s, but and if he, if he let the fire go out, he was put to death because it was a major big deal for the tribe to not to have fire. Fire's good. But anybody that was around in the last few months listening to the news knows that fire can be devastating. It took out an entire town in California and, 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 and forests. And, and, and if, if you've ever seen a house burn, it's, it's, you, you get the idea of just how powerful fire is. You have to respect it even though it's ultimately good. Well, I think the fact that God appeared as a burning bush uh, or call of him a flame, it wasn't really a mistake on his part. It wasn't coincidental. I think it, it represents something very, very powerful, very strong. And if you play it with fire, you're going to get burned. Fear of God. Respect for God. So number two is, is like I said, is, is respect God. For fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, 
But fools despise wisdom and instruction. This comes from Proverbs 1.7. That's the King James Version right there. Just since we're talking about different versions, let's do that same one in another version. Let's, let's do the message. Start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their nose at such wisdom and learning. Let's take a look at the New Century Version. Knowledge begins with the respect for the Lord. Fools hate wisdom and discipline. Common English version, respect and obey the Lord. This is the beginning of knowledge. Only a fool rejects wisdom and good advice. New International Reader's Version, if you really want to gain knowledge, you must begin by having respect for the Lord. But foolish people hate wisdom and training. You see how similar they all are? They all say the exact same message. Foolish people don't like training. A lot of people hate to be told what to do. Anybody that's ever been a teenager knows that. Anybody that's ever lived with a teenager knows it worse. Nobody likes to be told what to do. Have you ever been afraid of somebody that is only trying to teach you and help you? Maybe it was your parents when you were a kid growing up. Maybe they scared you. you know, maybe it was a brother or a sister. Could have been a teacher. Could have been a coach. If you were in the military, your drill sergeant is a really good example of that. Those guys are scary. But because of the way they teach you, because of the way the things that they show you, it keeps you alive later. It's for your good. We, we shouldn't act the way we act in Christianity out of fear of God. We really should act the way we act out of love for God. I saw a sign just three days ago. It was a guy holding up a big sign. And it said, um, love Jesus or you will burn. Huge big orange letters with flames going up anywhere. And as I drove past, I thought to myself, really? Is that the best way to get disciples? went to a play once, and this play, I forget what it was called, it was like the Heaven and Hell play or something, and, and it was just a whole bunch of vignettes of these people doing these little acting out things, like it was, uh, they'd sit on a chair, and they'd, you know, be on the stage pretending to be driving, and, and, and uh, you know, why don't you come uh, to church with me? Oh, Mom, I don't want to go to church, it's boring, and I don't believe in any of that stuff anyway, but honey, you know, I'm really worried about you. Oh, this going to crash, and they fall off the chairs, and they pretend they're in a car wreck, and they're laying there. And then the lights change red. <laughs> These demons all come back and they grab the teenage girl and she's screaming and they drag her off and then the lights all turn white and angels come out and take the mother away and stuff. And they do this over and over and over for an hour and a half with all these different vignettes. And I thought, wow, is that the way to get discipline, disciples? Get people that follow God and want to change their lives for the better. Is that the best way? And some people would say, yes, it was, because like a thousand people went down afterwards there to, to accept Christ in their lives. But were they converts or were they disciples? I'm not sure which. Maybe. But I don't think it's the best way. Does this draw you closer to God? being afraid of God. How do you gain the kind of wisdom that will make your life better and other people's lives better out of fear? So respect God. Respect God. Uh, the third thing is trust in God. Love God, respect God, trust in God. Proverbs, trust the Lord with all your heart and don't depend on your own understanding. Remember the Lord in all you do, and he will give you success. Don't depend on your own wisdom. Respect the Lord and refuse to do wrong. Let's assume there is a God, huh? I know. I've been in his presence. I know there is a God, and I'm assuming that most of you are here, but because you believe that there is God and God is real, and, and, and some of you may, somebody may be here just checking out this whole thing and feeling what it's like, but let me tell you, and, if, and, and I come and talk to me afterwards, and I will tell you, I know there is a God. It's not a, it's not a guess, and I'll tell you why I know, and I would be happy to, but let's assume that we know that. 
And then he created the world, and then he created you, and then he's all powerful, and then he's everywhere at once, and his ways are beyond yours, and he is pure goodness, and he never does wrong. And if that's the case, I think you can trust him. And if God is in control of what went into these books, I think you can trust these books. He made sure that he told us what we need to know. That's why you need to read this. Now, admittedly, there are some things in here that you're going to read and you're going to go, that does not make sense to me. Am I the only one? Because if you look at one of my uh, Bibles here, it is filled with writing in, in the margins. I mean, everywhere. There's little marks, there's little questions, there's little, there's one here. Uh, just an example, I'll give you, there's an example in uh, First Kings, Second Kings, and there's a story in there, and I'll just read it to you, you, know, you get it, uh, Elijah was a prophet, and he's going around talking about God, and it says, from there Elijah went up to Bethel, and on the way some boys came out of the city, and they made fun of him, and they said to him, what's up, old bald head, hey, skinhead? And Elijah turned around, and he looked at them, and he put a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two mama bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of those boys to pieces. Now, the note that's in my Bible here in the margin right there, it just says, overreaction, question mark? Because <laughs> when I read that, I thought, isn't that a bit much? Why would God send a couple of bears to tear apart 42 kids, kill them for picking on a bald guy. And it took me years. I mean, I, got my, I had to put that one aside and go, I don't get it. I don't know. I don't know. But I kept thinking about it. And eventually I came to this, you know, like, first of all, I was thinking of it wrong. I was thinking of death as a bad thing. But when you're God, you know that death is merely taking somebody out of this miserable world we live in and taking them into paradise and into eternity. So what he did with those boys these were street urchins. They were a young street gang. They probably didn't have much of a life. They probably were miserable, looking for food every day. He took them all into eternity. And yet he did it in a way that here we are thousands of years later talking about it. He left a, a very strong message, and that message is, don't mess with my prophets. Believe them. Pay attention to them. But... The point is, you're going to read some stuff in the Bible that you don't get, you don't understand, and that's okay, because uh, um, God is beyond us. And, and there are people, that if you don't understand things, that you can go to and ask, what about this? What about this? I, I've got people that I, I have on speed dial. I don't get this one. This doesn't make sense to me. Well, let's, let's talk about it. But you got to ask. When my son was little, he, we got a report card back, and he was like flunking out of something, and he, and he said he hadn't done any of his homework. And we're like, well, why did you do your homework? Well, it was hard. Why didn't you ask for help? He didn't want to ask for help. He was too proud to ask for help. And you're like, really? You know what? If you're too proud to ask God for help, think about that again, because first of all, nobody's going to know. Just you and God. And he can keep a secret. <laughs> so how do you ask for help? You pray. Pray about it. Ask for help. Turn to God and say, hey, pray sincerely for help, for wisdom. A sixth step in biblical wisdom is don't rely on the wisdom of the world, no matter how good it looks. I'm talking about, you know, bumper sticker wisdom. There's a lot of, a good, First Corinthians says this, I say this because the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. He catches those who think they are wise in their own clever traps. Now, there's a lot of really great best-selling self-help books in the world. Dr. Phil's Self Matters, The South Beach Diet. I just Here's a list of some of the top sellers. Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. How to Win Friends and Influence People. Think and Grow Rich. Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus. The Power of Positive Thinking, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Oh, the Places You'll Go, and the Bible. These are all bestsellers. 
all written by very smart people, Dr. Phil, Dr. Uh, Eggleston, Dr. Rubin, Dr. Gray, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> but one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> Don't rely on the wisdom of the world. Don't base your philosophy, like I said, on bumper sticker sayings. The one who dies with the most toys wins. That's not true. Don't even listen to particularly, supposedly smart people necessarily. The great Greek philosopher Aristotle said this. He said, happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. Not true. God isn't as concerned with your everyday happiness as he is with your growth which will lead to eternal happiness. So many philosophies that run around, you know, in the world, modernism versus postmodernism. You know what that is? Postmodernism, we don't know anything unless we know it 100%, everything about it. That's impossible. So the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything. Of course, if we can't know anything, how can we know that? I'll tell you what you can know. Uh, the message uh, puts it this way. Uh, it puts Psalm 119, 9, 11 like this. How can a young person live a clean life? By carefully reading the map of your word. I'm single-minded in pursuit of you. Don't let me miss the road signs you've posted. I've banked your promises in the vault of my heart so I won't sin myself bankrupt. That's poetic. But the NCV says it this way, I've taken your words to heart so I would not sin against you. Taking your words to heart, which brings us back, of course, to number one, which is read the Bible. In 1 Timothy, Paul sent a message, uh, a letter to Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy, by the way, is, is a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, who was an early leader of the church. And basically the letter says, hey, Timothy, woohoo, I've been keeping an eye on you, you're doing a great job. And here's some stuff to remember when you're leading your church. That's basically what the book of Timothy is. And he says this. He says, get the word out. Teach all these things. And don't let anyone put you down because you're young. Teach believers with your life, by word, by demeanor, by love, by faith, by integrity. Stay at your post reading scripture, giving counsel, teaching. And that special gift of ministry you were given when the leaders of the church laid hands on you and prayed, keep that dusted off and in use. Cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. The people will all see you mature right before their eyes. Keep a grasp on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted. Just keep at it. Both you and those who hear you will experience salvation. So, recap, application, just quick recap here. How do you become a wise guy? First, read the Bible. That's your assignment this week. If you don't read the Bible, go home and, and read two chapters. Let's see what you get out of it. If you don't have a Bible, go online. There's lots of versions of it. Or go onto a phone app and get it and read it. Or if you don't have a Bible and you want one, I have, I have one for you right here. Just come on up afterwards and help yourself. I got them in English, I got them in Spanish. Second, fear the Lord. Respect God and show that respect by treating others as Jesus would. With every decision, especially in the hard moments, ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Three, trust in the Lord. Give it a shot. Once you figure out what would Jesus do, do that. See how that works out for you. It might not work out well. Five, ask for wisdom. Pray for it. Remember uh, um, uh, Solomon. Solomon asked for, asked for wisdom. He... Uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, God said to him, oh, what, what do you want me to do? You, you want me to uh, make you rich? You, you want me to uh, slay, uh, slay all your enemies? 
Do you want me to give you a, a really long life? And Solomon said, you know, I'm a leader here. I'm a king, and uh, I'm not so good at it yet. Could you just give me wisdom? Yeah. He said, all right. And because you asked that, and because that was so smart, I'm also going to slay your enemies. I'm going to make you rich, and I'm going to give you a long life. Throw that in as a bonus. Um, be patient. Life change doesn't happen overnight, except that there may be others who know more than you do. You know, um, one of the greatest things that I ever did was finally admit that maybe there were other people that knew something about other things more than I did. I always thought I was the smartest guy in the room. And the day I figured that out, That's where I was finally able to start reading the Bible and listening to people that had something to teach about the Bible and say, maybe they're smarter than I am. <laughs> maybe they know something. Six, don't rely on the wisdom of the world. Put down the pop psychology self-help book, even if it was written by Oprah, <laughs> and pick up a Bible and read it. Second Timothy says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong with their lives, for correcting faults, and for teaching how to live right. Using the scriptures, the person who serves God will be capable of having all that is needed to do every good work. So how do you know when you finally have wisdom? Well, when you can give it advice to other people based on a bigger truth than just your own life experience, and when you can not only talk the talk, but you can walk the walk, because remember, wisdom isn't just knowledge, it's applied knowledge, and once you can do those things, you will be much wiser, and you'll be able to help other people live a better life, and you'll live a better one yourself. Father God, we know this wisdom stuff is really, really hard. Um, and, you know, even the most experienced of us in the, in, the, in, in the widest terms of the world have had all different kinds of different experiences. We still don't have a fraction of, of all those experiences that everybody lives. We are limited. So for us to take what we know and make all of our choices out of our own personal experience is just not the breadth of wisdom that we need. But you, Father, you know it all. And you wrote it down for us. So help us get into the Bible. Help us understand the Bible. Help our comprehension. Help us meet people that will help us learn more. Guide us, Holy Spirit, walk with us. Give us guidance and encouragement. And Jesus, I ask you to shine your light on us so that we might reflect that light out onto others. We pray this in your name. Amen. Maybe today is the day that you decide, like I did that one day, that I was going to be a Christ follower. I was going to take the lessons that he taught and apply them to my life and take him as my Lord and Savior. And if you're here for the first time and, and I haven't done that before, you're here for the eighth time and I haven't done that before, and, and uh, maybe today's your day. And all of us, we can all say what I'm about to say. So if today's the day, say it with me. And if, and if uh, for the rest of us as well, just repeat after me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And he is my Lord, and he is my Savior. Amen. If you have anything that's going on in your life that you would like some prayer for, we have people that will be right down here to pray for you. And uh, if you want to talk more about this walk with God thing,
come on up here afterwards and talk to us about that. And if you need a Bible, come over here and get one. No charge. And have a great week.